Okay, so today's going to be review for the first part of class, and then I'm going to do an on the board normalization all the way to, you know, physical diagram, um, which is why you'll notice there's now a tripod sitting in front of the class instead of the camera being at this wonderful angle that looks up the ceiling. Um, I get more of the board straight on if I use the tripod. Okay, so the slides are going to be on the screen slightly different than what's on Brightspace. I forgot, I can't say I forgot. I didn't have a chance to upload the updated slides. There's one slide that changed. And it's the first one. So it's not the end of the world. Um, so originally the midterm was 45 multiple choice questions. It is now 40 questions. Um, it is closed book. It's an hour in class. Uh, closed book's a relative term because it's done on your laptops. Um, I am going to patrol, but you know, I know, I'm realistic about my expectations. Um, and it's 20% of the final grade. Now, if anybody has any accommodations that I have been not been made aware of, because I went through the list I got and I didn't see anybody from this group, if anybody has accommodations that needs extra time on the test or whatever, email me so I know, so I can adjust them automatically. Um, all right, and it's worth 20% of your final grade. It used to be more questions for a longer period of time. And then I realized some of those questions tended to be redundant. That's the same thing three times. It's kind of stupid. So I dropped some of the questions. It is coming out of a question pool and they're randomized. That means, well, fine, the pool is as deep as a puddle. So there's not a whole lot of extra questions, but it is in randomized order. So the odds are you're not gonna, whoever you're sitting next to is not gonna have the exact same test as you anyways. Um, and I aligned the time per question to be more what is considered standard for college tests. Um, realistically, 40 questions in an hour and it's multiple guess and true and false is not a long, big test. All right, so what's going to be covered on it? ER diagrams, uh, which covers entities, attributes, and relationships. Uh, the first three normal forms plus, you know, I think there's one question on voice cod. Um, some questions about database design and some questions about indexes and views. I'm just going to go through the different topics quickly because literally half the stuff we covered in the last three weeks. Okay, so as a reminder, an, an ER diagram is usually made up of entities and their relationships. An entity is a person, a place, or an object, an event some sort of concept in a user's environment that a given organization wants to maintain data about. So that's the definition of an entity. Um, and some examples, you know, book, customer, school, course, you know, prof, that kind of thing. And they're represented on an ER diagram by a box, a rectangle. Uh, attributes are the things used to describe an entity. Um, normally it's an ellipsis. It's known as an oval or a, you know, a wide circle, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, so regular single valued attributes go into a single circle. Uh, Multi-valued attributes, in other words, a list will come into a double circle. So, if, you know, a series of phone numbers, a series of skills would be a list. And then there's composite attributes, um, which can be displayed two different ways. One is as below, which is the um, one attribute with attributes flying off of it. And the other way is um, parentheses inside. So the alternative, so display would be, no, that's not what I wanted you to do. No, really? Try that again. Parentheses. With my awesome mouse drawing skills. Um, either of them are acceptable. And there's three kinds of relationships. One to one, one to many, and many to many. 
um, make sure you know what the different symbols are. Um, an example of one to one is a country has a prime minister or a president or a chancellor or whatever the heck the position is called. Um, a project manager can manage multiple projects and students attend multiple classes and each class is made out of multiple students. And the four symbols that you should be aware of is as follows. The first one at the top is one and only one, which when we look at it, the first line over here is that describes the first word in that, so the one and only one, or in this case, the one or more. So the vertical, the first vertical line going towards the symbol is the one, and if it's a circle, then it's zero, and then the other symbol displays whether it's um, one or more. So when you read them, as you go down, the first one is one and only one, the second one is one or more, uh, zero or more, uh, uh, sometimes also called as zero, one or more, depending on, you know, who discussed it with you. And then there's zero or one. And basically zero means that it's optional. Um, cardinality is the part that, essentially it's the two parts of the symbol. The first part is the minimum number of instances, in other words, one or zero. And the maximum is the second half of the symbol, which tells it whether it's one or more. If anybody has questions, you know, you just, yep. Yeah, I'll be talking about that when I talk about uh, normalization. A multi-valued attribute and a multi-valued dependency is two totally different categories of information. Actually, I'll cover the first one. A multi-valued attribute is a piece of data that contains one or more possible answers at once. In other words, I ask you, what are your skills? Well, I'm just, just saying that as an example, right? Everybody's got usually more than one skill. Uh, the fact that you're able to drink Tim Horton's coffee is an amazing skill. Stuff tastes like coffee made through a pair of old work boots. Just saying. Um, it's just the bravest people ever. I used to be addicted to it, then I discovered it was terrible. Um, that's a skill. You Apparently you program, that's the second skill. If you play video games, maybe you got some skills at video games or, you know, whatever you play. Well, it's in theory would become multiple records. So a multi-valued attribute is a list of values, but for now it contained in a single attribute. So a list of skills, list of phone numbers, list of email addresses associated to only one person. That's a multi-valued attribute. It is. I mean, that's why it's not that later on you break it down as part of the design process. And when I get to normalization, then I'll talk about the multi, um, multiple dependency thing. So, this is a fully full fat ER diagram. Uh, well you guys have already seen this because I used it already, this term as an example. And when you look at it, you've got um, entities, attributes. This one happens to be a primary key or candidate key. Uh, we have relationships that display their cardinality. Uh, this table here happens to be an associative entity because it resolves what was originally a many-to-many. -many. Like that. In actual fact, I got that backwards, but that's okay. Um, there won't be a diagram that complicated on the test. Most of the diagrams are like one or two entities. They're just asking, you know, what kind of relationship is this? Or, you know, what kind of attribute is this? Okay. Normalization. So, the first thing you have to talk about normalization is think about the goals. And the goal of normalization is to 
reduce redundancy. You want to get rid of duplicated data. You want to get rid of unattached data. You want to get rid of um, things you have to delete in more than one place, the risk of losing data. So the goal is, the end goal is you want to remove all three kinds of, an of an anomalies. Uh, insertion, which means when you add data, you have to duplicate something. Uh, deletion, which means you need to, uh, when you delete something, you lose data. And a modification is if you have to update a value, you end up having to update it in more than one place. Uh, if you want to think back to when I was discussing this originally, I was using the example of the employee for one where uh, one employee's record was in that table twice and if we needed to update their salary, we had to update their salary in two places. Or if we deleted a specific employee, we'd lose the fact that there was a tax accounting course that was taken. Those are anomalies we have to avoid. So, to achieve first normal form, um, we need to identify and remove multi-valued attributes. So, this example has um, a multi-valued attribute in it, which is the phone number. When you look at it, um, this customer has two phone numbers, but only one of everything else. So in this case, the phone number is a multi-valued attribute because those two phone numbers are only tied to one customer. And the other rows are fully self-contained. So to resolve the first one, what we end up having to do is finish repopulating the data so the entire row is full. So we don't want any multi-valued attribute, and how do you resolve that? You make sure that the entire row has all of its information. In other words, you populate both primary keys. Yes, there's going to be duplicate values going into the primary keys, which is not great. Um, but technically, this is now in first normal form. So we got rid of the multi-valued attribute. The full row is contained. We're ready to go into second normal form which is to be in second normal form, something must first be in first normal form. And we have to get rid of partial dependencies. So when we look at this diagram, um, we can see that there's two partial dependencies. The customer number, let me say, the customer phone depends on the customer ID. The bank account type depends on the bank account. The bank account type has nothing to do with the customer and the phone number has nothing to do with the bank account. So those are what's called a partial dependency. In other words, the phone number and the bank account, each of those columns only depends on part of the primary key. So if it depends on only part of the primary key, those are known as partial. In other words, because part, partial. We need to break them out into their own entities. So to make it a little more uh, correct, I guess you could say. You would create uh, two tables. And when I do the example on the board after this, it's going to be a much better example in these slides. Um, the, once we've separated the, two into the, two, the table into two pieces, um, now where there's no more partial dependencies, each column and each table depends only on the primary key. But there is a problem with this example, which is why I'm saying when I do this on the board after, it's going to be much better. Um, the problem is, by going through this exercise, we actually lost the association between the customer and the bank account. Um, but the point was, is just show you guys how to break out a partial uh, dependency, not, not how to resolve the whole thing. And for the third normal form, is it has to be in second normal form, and all the transitive dependencies are removed. And a transitive dependency happens when one attribute that is not a key field depends on the value of another attribute that is also not a key. But that field depends on the primary key. So the example we have here is because the department ID is not part of the primary key, So it's literally not. The department name depends on department ID, and department ID depends on employee ID. 
when you start talking about attributes in a table, and if you go, this depends on this, but this depends on that, that means there's a transitive. In other words, you have to transition through one key. Well, sorry, you have to transition from one identifier to another identifier to be able to identify something. So, you know, that's why it's called uh, transitive. You have to transit from one to the other, travel. And the goal is we want to not allow that to happen. So how do we fix it? We take the transitive, break it out into its own table so that the department and the department names is its own entity. And we added the department ID. We kept the department ID here as a foreign key, but it's not part of the primary key here. So the de this depends like this, and now it's fixed. That's technically third normal form. And Boyce Cod, it's a theoretical concept. It rarely ever happens that you need to use it. Uh, almost never used. And 95%, 98% of the time, third normal form is more than good enough. Uh, so just review those couple of slides from the normalization lecture about Boyce Cod, and you'll be more than covered for the test. All right, so the desi database design process um, is made up of five steps, which we covered two weeks ago, if I remember right. And they're broken down as identification, describe, relationships, normalization, and review. And as long as you remember what these steps are, you're good. We're not gonna, it's not going into tens of detail on that. Um, however, there might be questions on this topic, how to resolve a a, a certain kinds of relationships. Many-to-many uh, -many being the number one um, contender for resolving complex relationships. And how do you resolve a many-to-many? -many? You create an associative entity in the middle, um, like such. So if right now, a student can have many subjects and each subject can have many students. In a real physical database, it's impossible to do that. Okay, most database engines don't let you do that. I'm sure there's a few out there that'll let you do it. Um, I know old versions of Oracle would, and Access absolutely lets you. Not that Access is a real database engine, but you know they try to tell you it is. How do you resolve it? By creating an associative entity. And essentially, the goal is if you have an associative entity where basically if you look at the line and you look at my hands, you have the crow's foot at each end. What should be happening is the crow's foot should be pointing in the middle. So if it's like this at each end. So if we go to the previous slide, crow's foot at each end, right? Now, if when we go to the next slide, what happens is the crow's foot are actually pointing to something else. So it's single values at one end and many values pointing to each other instead of pointing away from each other. That's the visual, the little visual of how you resolve a many-many relationship is you take it so that the many points in the middle instead of at each other. So this table in the middle is known as an associative entity. Uh, I've heard it called a bridge table, a junction table. Um, it has all kinds of names. And what, what's in it? Usually its primary key is made up of the primary keys of the source table. So the primary keys are also foreign keys at the same time. And we're almost done with the review. I don't do in-depth reviews because we literally spent weeks and I recorded every lecture for you. So, you know, I'd rather do something more interesting. So indexes, definitions of an index. It's a data structure that helps locate data easily and improves the efficiency of queries. Overuse of an index can slow down the database because it can slow down writes, because every time you write a record, it also has to update every associated index. If there's too many indexes, it can slow down the query optimizer so it doesn't know what to do anymore. If it doesn't know what to do anymore, it goes with the safe process, which is a table scan. In other words, it reads every single row instead of going through the index to find what it needs. Um, all primary keys are indexed and they're always uh, unique, but you can also create other unique uh, keys on other columns if you want. Um, a common one you'll see in database systems is the username being unique. 
Maybe the email address being unique to make sure that you can't have a duplicate email address. You actually hard code it right in the database. Um, they have non-unique indexes, which is used to improve performance of searching against um, specific columns that are regularly used. Uh, if you have a customer, for example, you have a customer's table, you might have email address, phone number, maybe postal code um, as indexed fields. Maybe there's a username in there, who knows? But you know, if normally if you look up customers on a regular basis, and if you've worked anywhere that actually has customer lookups, you'll know what I'm talking about. Because you know when you call, you go and you contact your cell phone company because you want to change your plan or whatever, the first thing they'll ask you, what's your phone number? Because they're going to look you up by phone number. And then they ask you for some other information, but by then they've already pulled up your record. It's just verification after that. Um, you call, um, like you get a, an, a hold of Amazon, often they'll ask you what's your email address that's associated with your account. That's you know usually the first step for verification with Amazon. And those are fields that would be non-unique index, but indexed. Uh, views. A view allows information to be presented to <laughs> Views allow information to be presented differently to different users. Uh, depending on how the application is written, it may switch out which view is used so that maybe less data gets pulled back, maybe the data gets filtered, uh, you're hiding columns, um, depending on which groups have access to what, that might have separate views. Uh, it's a good way for controlling access to data, which is a bit of an antiquated concept, I'll be honest. Um, views more often are used for reporting and for simplifying complex calls. Uh, specifically uh, because most applications have built-in controls now. So that, you know, user A is only allowed to see X, Y, Z and user B can only see, you know, GHI kind of thing. You know, depending on who they are, the application controls where they're allowed to go. It's not the database engine per se, um, because normally that's easier to maintain than changing database structure. But old applications would probably still have these kinds of views laying around. Um, there's virtual views, which are used in databases and computed on demand. Uh, and materialized views, which are used in data warehousing to help speed up queries. Virtual, uh, virtual views um, literally run the underlying query every single time you call from it. Therefore, it's just like a bookmark. That's pretty much all it is. Um, whereas the materialized view needs to be refreshed on a regular basis. It's basically another table. It looks like a table. It acts like a table. It even smells like a table, but it's not a table. They, you have to refresh it every once in a while to make sure the data is not stale. Normally done once or twice a day. If that, just to keep things up to date. So, what happens when we query a view? Uh, since a view is not a true table, it doesn't actually contain data. It when we query the view, like we're here we're talking about dynamic views, not materialized views. Uh, when we query a view, it acts as the source tables, captures the data, processes it based on what the rules of the view were, and then outputs it. Um, however, if you're going to modify the data, it needs to be done directly at the table, not through the view. Unless you've jumped through the hoops and done all the magic and, you know, sacrificed a chicken at midnight to make an uh, updatable view work which I recommend don't ever try to do. It's just not worth shortening your life for that. It's such a waste of time. Because um, time wasted is shortening your life because you could have been doing something better with your time. So don't waste your time on trying to make it unless somebody's paying you to do it. Um, so, like I said, if you need to modify the data, you're going to do it with regular update statements straight against the tables. The data is updated automatically in the views. It's like magic. Um, so, to create a view, you would go um, create a replace view, whatever it's called, as select column, whatever from, it's just an SQL statement. And the replace view, like the or replace, depends on whether or not the number of columns coming back is the same. 
So if you're going to change the number of columns or even the data types of the columns coming back, so maybe originally had like an integer and two var cars, and suddenly you're, it's going to be var car, var car, var car. Um, you're better off dropping the view and recreating it than trying to do a replace because a 50-50 chance it won't work. Uh, if you're adding the number, adding the number of columns, removing a number, a, a number of columns, you have to drop it and recreate. The replace will not work in most database engines. Um, I'm just going to ignore that second block of text because it's totally irrelevant. So, non-updatable views. The view is not always updatable, as I said. Um, there's specific criteria to make a view non-updatable. Um, one of the things is you cannot, you must include the primary keys. You cannot have any aggregate functions such as count. You can have group by, you can have distinct, you can't have having. Uh, anything that actually filters the data past a uh, basic where clause or does any kind of manipulation to the data will turn into a non-updatable view. Which is basically why you'd want to use a view in the first place. Just putting it out there that, you know, all these complicated extra pieces that you use is literally why you'd create the view. By doing that, you'd make the view not be updatable. Therefore, the views are not updatable. Okay. So that covers that. Um, now, like I said, it's going to be this classroom at the normal time next week. It's an hour. And um, when you're done, you just get up and walk out the door. You don't need to hang around after the fact. Um, I will likely have an attendance sheet. That's just my way of making sure you were actually physically here so that when I look at my list and I've got 24 signatures that there was here and there's 29 tests submitted and I have nobody writing a test in Cal. You know what that tells me, right? There's four people getting a zero and probably being reported for cheating. So I will have the sheet right there and I'm probably even going to have a little sign on the door, remember to sign the attendance. I actually have a sign for that. It goes right on the door. Um, so that's the rules of engagement for, um, for that. So now what I'm going to do is I am going to put up the screen. And turn off the projector because I'm going to work right on the board. And you guys all get to enjoy my horrendous handwriting when I brought all my colorful markers today. I got fancy colors. I paid extra for those. <laughs> and you'll also see that I have a red line. Warn me if I start writing on this side of the red line because that means the camera's not going to catch it. Okay. So the camera catches from here to that red line. Okie dokie. Uh, sorry about the people at the back. I do need a fair amount of uh, board space, so it, the writing isn't going to be super big. Uh, if you can't read it, there's open desks. It's funny, I, I say that and they're like, yeah, no, no, I want to stay back here. I don't care if I can read. Okay, um, Wow.
Okay, that should be enough data to make my point. Okay, so right now we have unnormalized data. So it's not even the first normal form. And we have his favorite topic, a multi-valued set of attributes. And what's our multi-valued attributes? It's this chunk. Why is it multi-valued? Because Bob here has two entries, but it's not fully populated. That means we can't pull up this row of data because we don't actually have any data to populate it from. So, and the other reason why it's not in first normal form, we haven't identified the candidate keys. So what we're gonna do, the very first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna make it go into first normal form. And to make it go into first normal form, we are going to populate the rest. Like such. And we will try to identify our candidate keys. So what in here can we use to uniquely identify each row? If it's anything like the other examples we've done, it'll be the customer number and the item number. Between the two of those combined, we can find every single row uniquely. So now, technically, we are now achieved we've achieved first normal form. So right now there are no longer any multi-valued attributes. Candidate keys are defined or primary keys depending what word you want to use. Let me move to this side so that people that are over here I'm not blocking with my big head so you can see what we've accomplished so far. Okay, now to be in second normal form we have to get rid of partial dependencies. And when we look at this we have two sets of partial dependencies. The price and description depend on the item number. The address and name on the customer number. And You'll notice I don't have an order number. Like, you know the example we had before, we had an order number? I actively chose to not include it to make this example a little grosser. It's being done gross on purpose because this is like a weird edge case where you don't actually have an original primary key. And the quantity is dependent on the entire key. So, so far, this is what we have. We have one partial, and two partials. Write the word partial. So how do you resolve this problem? Is we take those two partial sets of dependencies and we create their own entities for them. So if we were to take that and we'd break it down as follows. And name includes five and ten, Bob and Jenny, their address, one, two, three six, seven, whatever. And we also have the item uh, 
price and description. Thirty-four, fifty-six at three ninety-nine, and uh, I think that was twenty-four ninety-nine. Those are screws, and that's plywood. And we got to make sure we don't lose the last bit, which is customer number item number, quantity, should not have underlines, that, and I need to draw in the last of the data, which would be five, thirty-four, fifty-six, thirty-four, and 16 to 12. And our keys are as follows. Okay, so technically we just jumped from second normal form straight to third normal form. Why? Specifically because I did not include an order number. So this is the simple example. I'm going to make this not be simple in a second, but I wanted to go through, you know, the very basic showing the partial dependencies as its own thing before I try to jump into a more complicated example. So right now we have the partials and the full. There's no transitives. Therefore, everything is now officially in third normal form. Life is easy. This is you hope for this. Life is not going to give you this, but this is what you hope for, something this simple to work with. Um, now, to make things a little more complicated, As you can see, I'm essentially lazy. I don't want to have to rewrite everything. I'm going to add in the order number, which suddenly things get more complicated. Now, if we go back to our original set of relationships, we're going to identify, once again, our partials and our uh, full dependencies. So again, these two, nothing changed. They depend on the item number. And we know item number is part of the primary key. And in this case, the order number plus the item number becomes the primary key because of other issues. The name and address Dep still depend on the customer number, but now the customer number depends on the order number. And the quantity depends on the full primary key. So this is a full depend dependency. This is the transitive. This is a partial, and this one is partial. So the big difference between this step and this one is suddenly up here, the customer number is not part of the primary key. We now have an order number. And down here we have the order number.
And again, it's going to be like such. So the, the things just get a little more complicated when we now have a transitive. Now, if anybody wants to take a picture, because often I get students that just want to jump up and take pictures of their phones before I erase that board, here's your chance. Yes, it's being recorded, but it's not the same as, you know, getting up and taking a picture with your phone. Yes, in this case we could. I just I'd have to write more and more and more. This example is not watching Dan write terribly on the board. It's, you know, working through the whole resolution process. So one of the advantages of T119 and 117, there's um, more whiteboard at the front. And I can actually put this on one on a screen and still be able to do the whiteboard so that you can still guys have the have it on where we started out. Okay. Going once, twice, three times. Okay. So right now, if we jumped over here, back over here, and we look at this, we know that this one is now actually in third normal form, as is this one. Why? Because the attributes all depend on the key and the entire key. The problem we have is this one up here is in second normal form. Why? Because we have a transitive. The name and address depend on the customer number, the customer on the order number as designed. So because we have to transition through one attribute to get to the key, it's a transitive. It's not good because as he brought up, what happens if that customer has two separate orders? So suddenly I go like this. Order 145, again, customer 5, Bob, and suddenly if I need to change Bob's address or change Bob's name, I have to change it in two places. So there's still an anomaly, there's an update anomaly. So how do we fix that? We take this first one and we explode it into two entities of its own. I'm going to leave these two here because they're already in third normal form. I'm going to put the fix. I really wish I had more whiteboard. Actually, you know, I'm just going to put the fix. I'll take a picture and then I'll put the fix above so that I can use that board for other stuff. Yes, I need a picture to actually remind myself of what I wrote. Okay. So if I erase that top one and I resolve the dependencies, we will have something that looks like this.
And I'm going to actually draw boxes around these so you guys can actually separate them visually because it's starting to get a little... And now, the top two are now also in third normal form. Okay, so some of the advantages for this. If we need to change Bob's name, we only need to change it once in place. Right? Uh, we need to change the description of the, pri the item or we need to change the price. We need to do it in one place. We need to change the quantity that was ordered. We only ever need to change it in one place. Um, a customer can have as many orders. No problem. We've eliminated all the anomalies. So that one big blob of text we had going across became four things. Here's a chance for another picture. For those of you that like taking pictures. That's where, you know, people with good phones get the flex and people with shitty phones just ask the people with good phones for pictures. Yeah. Right, now at the bottom here is a combination of the foreign key. This is a weak entity. This one is only the, um, the primary key is only the order number because in the original data, was this is a foreign key. I mean, I can actually put in, uh, right here, I'll put in a little bright little green line here to show that it's a foreign key. Okay, so now that we've normalized, we're going to diagram. So we have currently four entities. So I'm going to draw four boxes. And what we've identified in here is um, customer, which is this guy, and order, which is this one. We've identified items, which is this one, and then the Okay, so these are four entities. Now we need to do our relationships. Based on the data we had, we know that a customer a customer can place many orders. Each order belongs to one customer. Let me redraw this. That was a terrible crow's foot. And we still have to figure out our minimum cardinality. So can an order exist without a customer? No. Technically, no. Because how else would you know what is, if it's been ordered? Therefore, an order must have a customer. Technically, could we have a customer without an order in the system? Maybe just that at that point it suddenly becomes a business rule, right? That somebody would make a decision, can a customer be a customer if they haven't bought anything? For example, you register on Amazon, you haven't checked out anything. Technically, you're a customer, but you haven't bought anything yet. So, but in other companies, a customer is not considered a customer unless they've bought something. Actually, that's literally what my company that I work for, my day job is, if they haven't bought anything, they're not considered a customer. The customer, the customer considered a lead, like a potential source of revenue. So they go into two different bins. So an order, a customer may or may not have an order. They may have one or more. All right, um, an order item, can it exist? An order 
Must an order have an order item to be considered an order? Again, that's one of those nebulous concepts, right? Does it? Can the order be created without anything in it yet? Depending on the systems, the answer is yes or no. Amazon creates orders as you check out. Other systems create an order and then you add things to it. Um, by most systems, an order cannot be considered optional. So an order is mandatory and it'll have multiple items. Each item in an order can only belong to the one order and it has to have an order, otherwise it can't exist, right? And now for the item, an order item must have an item, otherwise what are you ordering if you're not actually buying anything? An item can be ordered multiple times and in theory it may never have been ordered yet. It went into the system, a new item that they're trying to sell, haven't sold any yet. So now we took these relations and turned it into this diagram. So a customer may place zero or more orders, but each order must be placed against one and only one customer. Each order may have multiple items in it. Each item may be ordered by multiple orders. This is an associative entity, which suddenly brings us to the point where technically this is a weak entity because it's unable to live without both an order and an item. So it's a weak entity. Okay, so here, you're a store. You just got batteries in stock. Nobody's bought the batteries yet because they, they didn't know they could buy them. So does the batteries exist in the store? Yeah. Therefore, now he's going to buy the batteries. That means that the batteries could have been sold or not sold, but they have been sold to at least one person. But they may not have been sold yet because they exist in the system, but they have not been sold yet. Which is why it's optional at this point. I wish the camera would pick that up. <laughs> It'll hear me talking off camera. But yes, so an item can exist in inventory, but it hasn't been sold yet. Therefore, yes, it exists as an entity, but it may not have had any orders placed against it yet. So therefore, it's optional. But it may also be pl ordered more than once, which is why it's a many. Zero, one, or more. It's been ordered once, it's been ordered many times, it's never been ordered. And as I was saying, since this is an associative entity, that also means that this is an identifying relationship, like such, because these two identify this, because this one is a weak entity. Yes, most associative entities are weak, because an associative entity cannot exist without the data that, that creates it. Otherwise, if it doesn't exist, We'll worry about that at the next step, okay? So now we have to add our attributes. So we know we have a customer number. And we know that's its primary key. We have a name. And we have an address. That is really annoying. And we know that an address is probably a composite attribute. Why? Because an address is, is more than just one thing, right? There's a street address, there's... So if we were to actually break it out, but we're not doing the analysis now, but if we could, this would be a uh, street. Postal code. This is a composite attribute that is made up of these attributes. So when we become a physical diagram, these will be broken out into its own pieces. So that's a composite. We just, I didn't write the whole person's address like on the board, but that technically an address is a composite because it's made up of multiple pieces. 
All right, now we have an order. We have the order number. which is its identifier. And when we're creating a conceptual diagram, we don't include the foreign keys, except on the associative entities. It's the only place we include the foreign keys. Why? Because this will get resolved when we start doing the physical diagram. So in the item, we have an item number. Uh, we have the price and the description. And over here, we have you guys are witnessing that my hand can't keep up with my brain. You'll notice I start dropping letters and I, I try to write too fast. It's because my brain's already moved past the letter it's trying to write. And the item number, I'm going to put them in as a single attribute because that's the primary key. And we also have the quantity. So our normalization over there becomes this diagram. We have everything we need from there represented here. Next step will be creating a physical diagram of this. Yes, picture time. Because I don't have a lot of whiteboard, so I actually have to erase this one. So, Actual fact, I'm going to get clever. I'm going to start on this side, doing the physical diagram, and I'm going to slowly erase that way as I make the same entities. So right now, these are entities and their attributes. What's going to become happen now is theoretically, I could do a logical diagram, which is basically a physical diagram without any data types. I'm just going to do it all in one step, just so you can see what happens. <coughs> and the good news is with the data we use, it already had all kinds of synthetic keys, so we don't need to create new synthetic keys. Right? We have item number, customer number, item number, order number. You know, We already have synthetic keys, so life is good. We don't need to create new synthetic keys because those are synthetic keys. They're no, they don't have a real life meaning. Okay, so I'm going to take my customer table entity and convert it into a physical table now. So I've got a something called customer. And we have a customer number, a name, and an address, but we already talked about how address is a composite attribute. We can't put it in as a single a entity. So we go address, city, and postal code. Really, there's more to it than that, but we'll accept it as is. Uh, when we are creating our physical table, I am going to do my best to try to follow my naming conventions, but apparently I suck at it. Everything is lowercase. So now I've created a table to define the customer. So I'm going to erase this to give me some whiteboard space. Oh, I went too far. I went erased or crazy. Okay, now I'm going to do my items table. And in here we have item number. Description and price.
This is so much easier to do when I'm typing. All right, so we've created these two tables. So now I'm going to erase from here. Notice I haven't given any data types. So I'm going to do the data types once I'm done doing the boxes. That's why you'll see my boxes are extra wide. So I've got room to write again. Okay, so now I'm going to create an order table. And in here we have order number and the customer number. Oops, I want more space than that. Because when we do this, we resolve the foreign key and we know that it goes like this. In a second, I'll populate primary keys and stuff. Like I'll draw them in once I've done finding myself some space. And the last item we have is order items. Like such, and we have order number, item number, and the quantity. Again, that's its own table, like such. And we know that we already decided that Those were the relationships that we had defined. Now it's starting to look more like what you see in MySQL Workbench. What we haven't done yet is draw our primary keys and our foreign keys. So we know the order number is a primary key. The, this is a compound primary key, primary key, primary key. Customer number in this case is a foreign key. And I really did this stupid here. Hang on, I need to rewrite some words. I didn't give myself enough room. Oh, it gets in my hand. These are also foreign keys. Now, depending on the diagramming software, uh, these are identifying relationships. Different diagramming software will show these differently, just so you know. In MySQL, an identifying relationship is a solid line. A non-identifying relationship shows up as a dashed line. Most diagram software won't even show you the difference. But in MySQL Workbench, this is what it's going to look like. The only step we are now missing is creating our, key, uh, creating our data types. So we know that our numbers are probably integers. That one's easy. All right. So now we're down to the point where we've got to make some decisions about some other, the other fields that we don't know. Because so far, all of our data for the keys were integers, so it's pretty safe to assume they're integers, right? Now, what kind of data types would we be using for the name, address, city, and postal code? They're all going to share the same data type, but they're going to have different restrictions. Pardon? Yeah, Varkar would be the choice. So, but we also need to tell it how big the var car is. Some database servers, for example, Postgres, will allow you to create an undefined length var car. Just because it lets you do it doesn't mean you should do it. Because it's just 
going to allow it to go until it just one day just crashes because it's not cutting off the data until it just runs out of memory for it. So you always have to define that. So if you look at the name, depending on what part of the world you're from, it might be a really short name, it might be a really long name. I had a student once from Puerto Rico. He had two first names, four middle names, and two last names. It was hilarious. Apparently, it was just some cultural thing where they just keep accumulating the, grand, the, the father's names as the middle names. So he had his whole ancestry as part of his middle name, which was kind of cool. And he actually would respond to any of those names. And I asked him, how did you, how did you learn that? She goes, my mother has sandals. As a Canadian kid, I didn't quite understand what he meant until he showed me a video. Then I understood. <laughs> the sandal comes flying if you don't answer fast enough. So for a name, let's just go with an assuming a fairly safe length of name. Probably 100 characters is probably more than enough. An address. So this we're talking about like a street address. Now again, this depends on where you are in the world. Most North American street addresses will usually fit in a pretty small uh, area. This better still be recording because I'll be very mad. <laughs> um, but in other parts of the world, I've seen some Spanish addresses that are... Um, German addresses are especially long. Um, more, like for example, our accounting system at my day job they allow 75 characters for an address. We're able to handle most needs with that. So we could go 75 for the address. City, again, most city names will fit in under 50 characters unless you're talking about the UK, you know, England. Why? Because they have really stupid names for some of their towns. Uh, especially when they start talking about Wales. Welsh names are kind of special. Uh, but in England, what they have is they'll have with a shire near some other shire. That's literally the name of the town, that this town is near another town. So if you're dealing with international addresses and stuff like that, city names, go for 50 as a minimum. They're probably safe. Maybe more if, you know, you know there's edge cases. Um, postal codes. Canadian postal codes are six characters long. Unless we allow the space, then it's seven characters long. Same thing for England, Australia. I have no idea what the postal codes are like in South America. Uh, German postal codes are six digits long. Um, Americans thought they were smart and then they discovered they were stupid. Uh, zip codes, right? the American postal codes. Five digits, right? Until they got to the point where five digits res represented a million people. So can you imagine being the post office person trying to sort through a million people's worth of mail every day for delivery? So they decide, hey, we're going to add an extension on it. So it's a sort station. So now American postal codes are actually minimum 10 digits long, right? 90210 dash, four characters. So that's 10. I'm sure they're going to run out eventually out of those four. They'll have to add a fifth. So for a postal code, unless you know a specific targeted um, length, always assume 10, just to be on the safe side, especially if you're dealing with internationals. Um, not sure how long postal codes are in China, but I know for a while they were like six digits long or something. Um, I think they got longer now, recently. Uh, I had one Chinese student saying, yeah, they're changing how the postal codes work again, whatever that's supposed to mean. Um, just add a letter. It fixes all the problems. You add a, a, a power of 26 to every postal code. All right. So if we look at quantity, based on the data we had earlier, there were only whole numbers, right? You don't buy half a screw. You technically don't buy half a sheet of plywood. You buy the whole sheet of plywood and you get it cut. Home Depot does not sell partials of anything. On the other hand, Loblaws sells things by weights, by qu quantities. You know, you don't buy five bananas, you buy 
whatever five bananas weighs times 59 cents. So depending on the system, quantity could either be an integer or a decimal. For what we were doing earlier, we're going to stick to integer because that's, you know, that's all we had was integers. So we'll go on the assumption that it's integers. Now, our description. Our descriptions weren't very long. So we can probably assume that they're fairly limited. Maybe it's coming from an old legacy system where none of the descriptions are more than 25 characters long, maybe 50 characters long. So in theory, we'd use a var car. Probably make it 50. And now we're down to price. Price is probably something that has decimal places. There are countries in the world that don't have decimal places on their currency. Um, Japan, for example. They don't have partials, anything, right? There's no decimal places in yens. One yen, 10 yen, one million yen. There's nothing less than a yen. Not sure about how it is in some other countries, but you know, you've got other countries that use dollars and cents. Or you got the British system that have dollars, pences, and pounds. You know, they got pounds, pences, and something else. So their money actually divides three different ways, which is kind of special in its own way. Um, thankfully, they've gone down to just, you know, pounds with decimal places, so 25 and a half pounds. So a price is probably uh, a numeric. And when we looked over here, all of our prices were four. So we're going to go five comma, that was the saddest comma ever, two, which will allow us to have a price of 999 and 99 cents. Yes, there's stuff at Home Depot for more than $1,000, but this is in Home Depot. They're building, building supplies. So this is the end of that big long journey. We covered from unnormalized data to an actual physical data diagram. That's primary keys, foreign keys, and data types. Tables are identified. We're following naming conventions. Because everything's more or less the same except for where my hand insisted on doing a capital letter. Now, what would happen is we'd develop this and suddenly we have to go back and now we do a, a refresh. We take a quick look and see what could we do better? When you think about what could we do better? In all of this, this isn't bad actually. It covers almost everything we need. There's only one major glaring issue. Can anybody take a guess what the major glaring piece of data that is missing? There's one big thing missing. And no, we were never given it. So don't worry that the fact you didn't see it here because it never showed up to the party. Uh, numeric decimals are interchangeable depending on the database server. Postgres will respect both, uh, MySQL respects both, Oracle does one, Microsoft SQL Server does the other. But most of the time they'll even take it and just convert it to whatever they want. They accept the keyword, but it becomes something else. So we are missing something really important. Hey? No, the foreign keys are there, that's what the green Fs are. No, we're actually missing a piece of data. Uh, no, we got the relations. What we're missing is a piece of data, as in, the report they gave us was incomplete and their system would be total garbage because of it. So, you went to Home Depot and you bought something. They gave you a receipt. Not quite, but it's kind of related to that. They give you a receipt. It sits in your basement for three years. You go, ah, I never used it in the last three years. I go back to Home Depot with my receipt and say I want my money back. There's no date. They can't prove when you bought it. Like most stores have a, a limited window of when you're allowed to return something, right? So this is post-design analysis. You look and go back, oh, oh, we're missing stuff. What are we missing? We're missing a few things in this, but the big one that's missing would be a date on the order. When was, it, when was the order placed? Normally it'd be date and time. Uh, something else that might be important is on the order item, we might want to include the price it was sold at. So that historically, we always know how much we sold that box of screws for. So instead of selling the box of screws for, for uh, three ninety nine, suddenly the price of aluminum or steel suddenly went up. 
So now we got to sell the screws for four ninety nine because you know we're losing money on the cost of the screws. But we don't want to lose the fact that we sold screws at three ninety nine. So we probably want to include a sell price here. It's not technically duplicated data because people say, well, price is there, so it's duplicated. No, this is a piece of what they call historical data or what they call point in time data, PETA, point in time. Um, point in time data is a PETA, is a pain in the ass uh, because you end up accumulating lots of extra data that you may never need. But it's there because it's point in time. So a point in time record is includes you know a date, what something sold for, um, Maybe even descriptions, all kinds of things like that. So those are two things that can be done to improve this design. Adding a, t a date timestamp to this and adding a sell price to this. And then we'd have a significantly better and more usable diagram and database. By adding just two pieces of information, suddenly we just expanded what it's capable of doing dramatically. That's it, folks. That's the moment. Um, so try to wrap up your labs. They're due next week. Um, actually, I think some of them are due this week. Most of them are due this week. Um, I have to go double check. Actually, I think they're due Friday, the last set of labs. Uh, I will get around to, around to grading them. It's just been a little crazy. Um, Next week, please come to class. I will ask you guys to spread yourselves out a bit more. It's fine when you're in lecture and you're all sitting together, but during a test, you know, I'd rather you guys kind of spread yourselves out. There's a lot of room in here for supposedly 40-something students, even though there's 22 in here right now. Um, one of the side effects of recording my lectures, I have lower lecture attendance. Um, yeah, and that have been said, you know, have a good one, guys. I will see those of you that come to lab tonight, if anybody comes. Last week, I had one person show up. I answered her question. Then we talked for 20 minutes, and I went home because nobody else came, which I, you're not going to hear me complain about being able to go home an hour and a half early. I've been at work since 5.30 today, so you know it makes for a very long Wednesday. I'm not saying don't come. I'm just saying you know, I'm not going to feel bad if you don't come. And i got to make sure I cut that off. I shouldn't have recorded that statement. <laughs> All right. Um.